Hey guys, this will be video 18 for the Gibson Les Paul restoration, which will basically just be a continuation of video 17. And I'm going to start back where I got cut off talking about uh, how most guys will um, take an ebony fretboard and then they'll stain it black, which ebony wood uh, is not black at all. It's very, very chocolate, and very rich in color. Make sure I'm in the camera. And uh, I personally think that's what's so beautiful about it. Uh, and the, the longer you play the guitar, the more you hold it, the oils from your, the natural oil from your own hands will keep it uh, uh, pretty much preserved. And uh, it's, it's not an oily wood as much as it is. It's just a very dense wood. And uh, I think it's best to just leave it very natural. And I don't know if you've ever played a piano that has uh, true ebony uh, keys. Man, they feel, they, they just have a different feel. I'm not really into playing piano, but I have played one before where you could feel the ebony. And man, it felt so much better than, than like a plastic. So I love the feel of a natural ebony. And I hate to see guys just stain it black. Typically, the reason they do stain it black is because ebony by, by nature sometimes has some really horrific streaking. Uh, personally, I think things like that are beautiful, but again, this is not my guitar, so I have to proceed with caution about those things. But let's see if that's in the camera. Like this right here, for the most part, this is a very uh, chocolate brown, deep, deep chocolate brown, almost black wood. And then all of a sudden you get this weird uh, light spot right there. I understand that if you wanted to add some coloring tint to that to, to knock that out or if you're working with the board you might discover that hey if this board has more streaking on one side uh, I prefer the grain the visual aspects of the other side more anyway well then glue the ugly side down <laughs> it's as simple as that so that might be the case with this board right here I'm not completely certain yet because this is Gabon Ebony, which is fairly, uh, very chocolate. It's not, it's not black at all. And uh, anyway, that's kind of where I was going with the, the last video. If you're, if you're going to stain the, the, the natural beauty of the wood, then why did you select a, a beautiful natural wood to begin with? Why didn't you just paint the fretboard black? You know, go with maple. And I'm being a bit of a smart ass there, which, you know, it, it is what it is. But to me, if, if we're building guitars, we love working with wood. And the reason we love working with wood is because of the, the unique characteristics of each, each piece. They're, 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 they're very, uh, they may be consistent, but they're, they're never a mirror reflection of the last piece you worked with. So anyway, uh, Krelicam was the word I was looking for. I believe Krelicam mahogany. This is not Krelicam. Krelicam mahogany is very, uh, it's very almost like uh, tiger looking. It'll be deep, dark chocolate black, and then all of a sudden it'll go stark blonde streaks and then reddish brown. Uh, it's a very crazy looking wood. Uh, it's very expensive and I guess sought after. I personally don't like that much vivid character in a fretboard because I'm a player. And if I'm playing a guitar and I'm looking down at the fretboard and I'm, I'm working a scale or a chord progression, I don't want to be distracted by the, 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 the visual aspects of the neck. I prefer it to be very bland or at a minimum just very subtle, you know, where everything's kind of a consistent chocolate color. So. I say that to say this, be very careful going with a wood that might have really beautiful chatoyancy and it might look great on the stand, but if you start playing it and you start looking into it and you're trying to do your, 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 your actual work on the fretboard, you'll get lost in the fretboard because of depth perception. Uh, it's amazing. I've, I've actually made that mistake before where I've used a real um, vivid fretboard which was beautiful. And then I started playing the thing. I was like, man, I couldn't, I almost couldn't uh, judge distance. And it was a very, I sold the guitar. I had to get rid of it. Couldn't stand it. So anyway, 
neither here nor there. But kind of keep that in mind when you're working with a fretboard. If you want to stain them black, stain them black, or, or at a minimum, just stain them chocolate. Uh, and also, on this note, by the time I get all the binding, now this is a cream binding, I won't be using cream binding on this guitar, uh, just because the all the binding that's on the guitar is white, and I will be tinting it in uh, what I jokingly call uh, a barfly tint, where it looks like, uh, you know, cigarette smoke, excessive cigarette smoke from some sort of barfly gig, so... Anyway, it'll have the barfly tint, and, and you don't you don't want to start with a creamy uh, ivory color and then try to do tinting. You want to start with a with a true stark white wood, and even on the vintage Gibsons, uh, I notice where they'll have the heavily uh, uh, faded and stained uh, lacquer, where the lacquer it's just the lacquer that's that stained. But then you look at the top of the fretboard. I don't care if it's a 1954, it's it's white as the day is long because it doesn't have any lacquer on it. So I'll, I'll have to do the same thing with this guitar. It'll look just like a 1950s or a 1960s or 70s. It'll have the, the deep amber lacquer uh, tint, but then you'll look at it from the front and you'll see the you'll see the white binding. So and it'll be probably around 80 thousandths. That's 90 thousandths. So look, it's a little bit thinner than that. So I got a little bit long-winded talking about some of that stuff and maybe even digressed around a little bit. But uh, be real careful about the wood you, you select for your fretboard. Uh, the tonal aspects of the ebony are, are very clear, very articulate. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful wood. It's incredibly stable. What are we, about seven minutes? Let me see if I can get that in the camera. This is the actual fretboard for this guitar. I hope that's showing up. It's precision. It's arrow straight. It's absolutely perfect. Um, and if the owner doesn't really want to see any of these blind highlights, then I, I'll take care of that later on. But we'll, we'll cross that bridge later on. Um, what was I going to say about this? Uh, I already mentioned that it's a true quarter inch thick. Uh, I might have, I probably rushed a little bit when I was talking about how. Benedetto did his guitar next. That was then. That was like back in the 80s or 90s. I'm sure he's probably doing a lot of CNC stuff now. Uh, and I have no idea how his his corporation how, as a company, how he's building them. And I don't really know how Gibson is building their necks. But I just know that if you're sitting there in your uh, backroom shop, you, you can build them like that and use the neck as the platform by which you actually work off of you could cut all your fret slots you know this is a straight edge you glue this on you know perfectly centered and then you can use your your you could do everything by hand with a little like a little flush cut saw it doesn't have to be with a three hundred dollar miter saw jig or anything like that uh digress a little bit there but um and and i think this this video and the last video is primarily for the guys that are kind of wanting to do this, but you know you don't want to spend fifteen hundred dollars on tools and 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 and, and machinery uh, when you could just go buy a fifteen hundred dollar guitar, you know. But you're you're really really feel the desi the desire to build the guitar, and you know that you can work the wood and you can work the sandpapers, the sanding blocks, and the chisels and the coping saws and you don't even need a jigsaw you could use a coping saw uh, for you know a hundred dollars worth of tools you can build a phenomenal jazz guitar and that's kind of what these last couple of videos have been about is trying to demystify the whole um, having to set up a five thousand dollar shop set of tools just to start building a couple of guitars so every bit of this can be done by hand and and it's very very simple if you really just uh take your time okay uh other woods I'll, i mentioned the the rosewood briefly about just the um uh, uh the, the hazards just proceed with caution working with the rosewood because the doctor that i had to meet with he mentioned something about once you get the dust in your bloodstream you know, it's it's always there and you're always subject to that 
a breakout again. And that and it happened to me about three months ago. I started working with some rosewood, and sure enough, I, I felt my face uh, uh, breaking out from the disorder. So anyway, be careful working with rosewood. It's beautiful. It sounds good. And what this is, I, I kind of just ended up using this as a mock-up. glued two pieces together, put a back on. I use this as a sample. Like if I've got a board, let's see if we're in the camera. If I've got a board here that has a weird funky grain to it, maybe the grain's going off to the left a little bit, well then I can take this little board and I can lay it on here. Let me see if I can get this in the camera. And I can lay it on there on a weird angle and I can kind of look at what I might be, how I might be able to rough out the the board in my hand like the ebony that I'm wanting to work with or work around a bad spot from discoloration. See I might be able to come up in here like this. Sorry if that wasn't on the camera. You know I might be able to work on that quadrant of the board and hardly even have any of that discoloration creep into the, the, uh, the fretboard. Woodworkers, you guys already know this stuff, so I'm not really telling you anything that you don't already know. Uh, this is uh, Bolivian Rosewood. Uh, I think they call it, is it Pau Ferro? Um, beautiful wood. Uh, this is perfectly, perfectly quarter. Uh, I'm tempted to turn this into a neck just to see how, how well it plays. The beautiful wood, very, very stiff, very dynamic tone. Uh, very complex, especially on like a mahogany neck. If you're looking for really complex tones, that might be an interesting uh, neck. The mahogany lower with the rosewood. Even Indian, Indian rosewood is a beautiful neck, beautiful sounding neck. So, okay. And what am I going to talk about a little bit more that I didn't get to cover in the last video? I went back into the whole Benedetta thing because I don't think I gave that any service. That was then, this is now. That was just the way he showed in his uh, vocational series how, how to build a neck. And even may, he might have even been approaching it from a standpoint knowing that most of the guys watching his video series, well, they don't have, you know, thickness sanders and planers and things like that. So maybe they're having to work with their grandpa's tools and stuff. So that might be why he approached it from that standpoint. And he even carved the neck. It was amazing with just like 40 grit sandpaper on blocks. He just went to town and started shape, shaping the roundness of the neck. And it was just amazing. Uh, you know, he was dripping in sweat nearly. But it was amazing how I realized, God, you could, you could do every bit of this even if you didn't have any electricity. So, anyway. Uh, Fretboard atop the S4S. Finished that. Already talked about that. Tone, strength, stability, health hazards. I covered the health hazards aspects of tone, of woods, tone, strength, and stability. Um, from a standpoint of strength and stability, uh, maple or mahogany for a lower is pretty much proven and has been proven for hundreds of years I guess you could say um, Spanish cedar probably I've never attempted that because being arrogant I'm, I'm at a point to where my skill level is such that I don't need to be working with the inferior woods anymore I need to be working with the you know the Brazilian stuff or the really high quality stuff so if you're just getting into this cabinet grade maple is phenomenal wood for for guitar necks uh, mahogany can get a little bit expensive, but I'm telling you, if you've got a woodcraft close by, uh, what does woodcraft have? The same thing that the big box stores have. They have air conditioners. And I would rather go to woodcraft and pay $20 a board foot for a piece of hunter and mahogany than go to a, a mill shop and buy mahogany from a warehouse out back that is, you know, $9 a board foot and... Uh, might have a high moisture content, but here's the kicker the cool thing about woodcraft the one I bought from it in Birmingham, Alabama uh, I think the hundred and mahogany that I bought the last time was uh, Under ten dollars a board foot. That's incredible. That's a smoking deal 
and for the amount of wood that I bought, uh, I think I built I built two flying V's, one Gretsch Jet Les Paul esque type body, and I got six necks out of that one board for way under two hundred dollars. So do the math of that. That's pretty incredible. So. Go to Woodcraft if you've got one. Great deals, great service, and uh, they got great suppliers as well. So, all right. So, and I got digressed a little bit from the tone and the strength. If you're going uh, from a standpoint of tone and strength, maple or mahogany for your lower, uh, rosewood or ebony for your fretboard, or maple. Uh, maple is an excellent fretboard, especially for the the, the Tele guys and the Strat guys. It's a just it's a beautiful neck. It's what the it's what is historically recognized. When I think of a really high value, highly valuable or highly sought after strat, man, I think of you know like a maple, maple like a one piece maple neck, which is extremely hard to build. But you can get a maple cap on a maple neck back, very affordable to build, and they sound incredible and just great for jazz funk blues country everything very good wood to work with uh, and then obviously the mahogany so I guess what I'm saying is you're probably uh, it's almost idiot proof you know <laughs> as long as you go with one of those woods you'll be fine um, and again if you've never worked with rosewood maybe just work with Indian rosewood and, uh, but just proceed with caution with your respirator type um, equipment that you have. Uh, thickness sanding with the oscillating sander versus the drill press station. Uh, some guys will set up a... Uh, some guys will, will set up a little, you know sander like this on the drill press and then they'll set up a fence and you'll have a let's see if I can get this in the camera you'll have a fence here and then you can thickness sand by pushing in if if the if it's turning this way which it is any any drill uh, I don't think any drill presses are designed to run in reverse probably for safety standards but they're always going to turn clockwise so on that note you're always pushing in from this side and the worst thing that can happen is it just it kicks it back even if you slipped and your hand went into it it's going to tear your fingernails up and it's going to hurt really bad but it's not going to pull you in um, but i say that to say this i don't like using my drill press that way because i don't want to put side pressure on my um, drill bit head i just i like i want my drill press to always be precise and dependable as a drill press and strictly for drilling. Uh, and then when I bought the oscillating sander, I really had considered going with like a really high quality, high end one. And uh, I got to doing a little bit of research and I, I try to use only DeWalt or Makita or Milwaukee and stuff like that. But I found this little oscillating sander at, uh, Harbor Freight, and it was a smoking deal under, I think, 160 bucks, give or take. And uh, it's pretty darn good. It's pretty amazing. Uh, I, I like it. And I, and I may pause the camera here and flip over according to how much time we've got and maybe just do a little demo sanding on uh, how I would uh, surface surface two, two of the sides, like, you know, this side versus that side, uh, uh, just with a little oscillating sander and uh, works really well. So let me look at the camera. We're at 19 minutes already. Uh, hopefully it'll go up to about 25 minutes or so. And then we'll cover what we got. I think this is pretty important. I'm gonna, I hope the camera doesn't cut off, but if it does cut off, I'll do another video and we will cover working with problematic wood. And when I talk about problematic wood, let me see if I can force this in. To me, that would be a problematic board. If it's bowed, you know, like in one direction, or it's bowed, like, you know, either bowed concaved or convex, that's kind of what I would consider problematic. Should it be thrown away? Absolutely not. 
and I sound like I'm contradicting what I said about the neck leafs, but there's certain times when you have to look at something and ask yourself, well, if, if I've got a board that I'm going to use as the fret board, okay, and, and that board is, is perfect up here, but then the last 20 or 30 percent has a little bit of a, of a bow up to it, or maybe a bow down, well, well look what I'm, what I'm gluing it to. That's like a brick. It doesn't matter if that's bowed up uh, an eighth of an inch or three sixteenths. A quarter inch, that's getting a little spooky. That's, that's pretty serious. But if this up here is perfectly stable and just this part up here is bowing, uh, then obviously, you know, don't, don't run the board that way. Uh, just make sure that when you rough it out, if you see a problem arise, ask yourself, well, can I use it in an area where it's, where it's fixed and real stiff and not movable? Use epoxy, clamp it, you know, make sure everything's under control. And if it laid down nice and flat, then uh, after 10 to 12 hours, the epoxy will encourage an unbelievable amount of pull in a board and, and it will never pull loose. Uh, but, but I say that cautiously and, and making certain that I don't sound like I'm contradicting what I said the other day about if you've got, you know, if you've got a board that, if you've got a, well, I can't really show it that, it's too small. And I don't want to break this, but if you've got a board that's got a, a twist in it, then that that probably needs to be thrown away. Don't don't fight don't fight wood like that. Your time is worth too much. So uh, talking off the top of my head here a little bit about some of this stuff, but I just want to make certain that I don't expect you guys to read my mind. And I know sometimes I'll say something, then I'll go back and watch the video, and I'll think to myself, well. Well, that doesn't apply all the time. You know, it applied at that moment when I said it, but I don't want anyone to think that I'm very dogmatic about a lot of these things. A lot of this stuff you can, you'll call, you, you, you make that call when you're in the shop. Uh, working with problematic material tools, knowing when to let go, meaning like if you've got it, if you're sitting there looking at a beautiful board that's just, man, you really got your heart and soul in it, but it's got that twist that one you, you gotta let it go otherwise it'll work you to death uh, same thing with tools there's certain tools that uh, I find myself I'm kind of a creature of habit I've had to force myself to just stop using certain tools because they're worn out and they're just making my life miserable and I, I don't give a you know what if they were they belong to my grandpa you know I don't I'm, I'm detached and you got to let it go and move on and get a, get new tools. Um, I talked about the orientation, the top half versus the lower half. If there's a problem with the board, well, then put it in a location where it, it's in a, in a real stiff area and you'll be fine. Um, don't use screws in any problematic situation like that. There's nothing wrong, and I hope the camera doesn't cut off. This is pretty important. But let's say you were that you did have a board back here. Uh, when I was restoring my boat, I used these a lot for, uh, they're a tapered drill bit for doing uh, screws, uh, silicone bronze screws. And you could, you, you could come in at a location where you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that that's where a mother of pearl inlay is going to be. Well, then you could come in, you could drill down and you could put some tapered dowels epoxied in to help hold that piece down um, and then it gets covered with the, the mother of pearl and I say that because I've taken enough old guitars apart to find uh, I have found screws in mechs before and was just you know, blown away it was I couldn't believe it. it was like holy cow man these guys are like true cowboys <laughs> doing some of this stuff so don't be afraid to, to go uh, out into left field with some of that type of stuff. If it's covered up and you know it's going to work and nobody's ever going to see it, you're not covering your ass. You're just you're just you're just using that prized piece of wood that you wanted to work with, and you're not being so such a stickler about certain things. And the reason I bring that up, let's see if we can look down this neck, and I'll show you why. Do you see that that bow? It's pretty serious. Should I throw it away or should I use it? 
pins. Once I, once I locate the best part of the wood, the board that I want, and maybe I cut out just that, just the fretboard, just the fretboard, then I'll, then I'll assess it. Or let's say if I know that it's bowing a little bit more down here, then I'll do exactly what I just said, and I'll make sure that that goes in the higher register of the board. I mean, that would be idiocy for me to, to build it with the bow in the part, in the area where the neck is, is floating. So, I guess what I'm saying, I haven't decided yet. Would I have used this on a client's guitar? Absolutely not. No, absolutely not. I, you know, this, this is the, the fretboard for this client's guitar. But if I'm building a guitar for myself, and one that I know that even I might sell one day, if I build this and it lasts for six months to a year with absolutely zero issues, man, I can sell it at any time and know beyond a shadow of a doubt, it's fine. It's going to be okay. And that's another thing I like, and I'm glad I thought of this. That's another reason why I like this truss rod, because this is a double adjustable truss rod, so that if I did have a neck that was beautiful on one side and ugly as the devil on the other side, but it had a real serious, well, when I say serious, I'm a machinist. I'm talking three thousandths, five thousandths. You know, if it was a sixteenth of an inch or eighth inch bow up, and I'm, or let's say it's bowing down really bad. And, and we all know that the truss rod, we want it to bow down, but in this neck, not this one, but it, if in that problematic neck, I could take this double adjustable truss rod, and after I build the guitar, and even with the strings on it, if it doesn't have enough forward relief, I can crank this truss rod forward and, and actually bow it forward. It's bizarre, and it works great. And I, and I can attest to that, I did that once. I put my frets in too tight, and the, the neck actually bowed back. This was like 18 years ago, 17 years ago. And I was able to use the double adjustable truss rod to crank the neck forward, and it, le it leveled out perfectly. But if I hadn't have had the double adjustable truss rod, it would have been a failure. So, kind of keep those things in mind. Uh, if the video cuts off right now, we covered some great territory. I'm happy with that. No screws, tapered dowels uh, with epoxy only. I wouldn't recommend that with, with tight, blind, tight blind. I'd rather you do that with epoxy. And keep in mind, you'll be able to use the 12th fret location, the 15th, 17th, 19th, 21st. And then, um, uh, I guess, the, I don't think there's a 23rd on a 24th fret. I think it jumps all the way up to the... 24th like the 12th like the double octave so keep that in mind according to what you're building and let's see i'm gonna i'm gonna pause the video there and then uh maybe do a little bit of oscillating sanding hopefully it'll it'll come back on but if not i'll end the video right there let's see if i can get it to pause Hey guys, I changed my mind on that, and the video is probably not going to last much longer than a minute or two because I'm not going to have time to set up the oscillating sander. What I'm going to do is just take some Penetrol, and I'm just going to show you uh, why I don't see the need of staining the ebony black. Because once you put just oil, once you start oiling the fretboard, uh, they, they get very dark anyway. And if the video cuts off within the next five seconds or so, just know that this is why I don't like the idea of blacking out the or, or staining the ebony. Look how dark that is. And that's wet, but they're beautiful. And man, when you put the mother of pearl, uh, I'll just hit this real quickly. This is the old original. See how beautiful that is? There's no, there's no, there's no black stain on that. And then um, I just did this for sample purposes. I wouldn't leave this oil on here. I'm about to take some acetone and immediately clean it off. So if the camera cuts off, know that I didn't leave that oil on there. I just wanted to show that, that there's no sense in going with a black stain or staining your fretboard or <clears throat> trying to do some sort of faux finish. Uh, we're working with a very organic materials anyway. Uh, don't try to change them into something that they're not. 
So that was basically my primary point. And this being acetone, it'll be beautiful and dark for just a brief moment, and all of a sudden it'll get it'll get really bland again because it'll be dry wood with all the uh, natural oil. The penetrol, I believe, is probably a mix of boiled linseed oil, which will dry uh, raw linseed oil. Uh, they claim it will will not dry. And a lot of the boat builders used to use raw linseed oil in the in the hull of the Carvel planked boats because my my sport fisher was a Carvel planked boat, and it was all about it was it was caulked with the cotton and the uh, the putty, and then it would swell up, and that's where it got its uh, water tightness. So the raw linseed oil. Uh, would allow the wood to stay very wet and oily um, but you that's not what you want on a guitar fretboard you don't want it sticky you want it dry uh, I'm not saying put penetrol on a guitar neck and I hope I didn't listen I'm just using doing that as a sample for you guys on camera here and I can't believe it hasn't cut off for 31 minutes right now so they say mineral oil is better than lemon oil on a fretboard. Um, I've always just used uh, lemon oil. It's always worked really well. It's beautiful. It smells good. It reminds me of the, the 80s when I had my old 62, no, mine was a 64 SG 